Hey guys, it's Pete from Hills Electrical. This is a quick video to show you the tips and tricks of owning and maintaining your new Metabank home. There are a few simple steps to understand and troubleshoot the new electrical equipment we have installed. And by the end of the video, you will know how your house operates inside and out. If you have chosen the option to have heated tower rails installed, we will have installed a radiant heated tower rail. These are very energy efficient and have been wired to a timer behind your bathroom door. We have already set the times for you. These consist of two heating cycles. Morning cycle starts at 5 a.m. and finishes at 10 in the morning. The evening cycle starts at 5 p.m. and finishes at 10 at night. If you wish to change these times, there is a YouTube video on our YouTube channel outlining how to do so. Your Clipsville FireTech smoke detectors are wired with 240 volt and have battery backup. They fully meet Australian standards and quality. Smoke alarms have a limited working life of 10 years and need to be replaced. You should test your smoke alarm for operation every six months and clean the unit regularly. A closer look at the smoke alarms. If, um, if we fire it up, this is, this is what will be happening if it goes off. And the hush button's here, just here, just press the, and it will stop ringing, which will solve your issues. Um, we recommend that you you've got to change your battery every once a year or every six months, depending on you can do it at daylight savings. This is often recommendation. So you pull it out and then you replace it with a new one. Just push straight in, and then you can just push it straight back into the ceiling. There is um, some instructions on the side of the unit, which um, if there's any other issues with the fire alarm, as you can see, there's a Use by date on the smoke alarm, which is most people aren't aware of. So every 10 years, we need to replace your smoke alarms for correct operation. Get at the front door now, and you'll notice that this is a quite a busy front door with five switches. Um, there's two sensor mechs down below, um, and we've got three switches here. They, some appear to do nothing, and they feel dead. Um, don't worry. The top one is it doesn't do anything. It's a garden light provision which goes to the side of the house, which is available for the landscapers to connect the transformer and can then connect up the 12 volt garden lights from there. The middle one is a lamp point. If you've chosen to have a, a lamp outlet on the side in your foyer, that will switch on your lamp. You leave the lamp in the on position and this switch will control it on and off. This sensor mech here is. Um, for the front lights, uh, it, at the, when you're pointing up, it's in the off position. When you point it to the right, they come on. So if you're expecting someone, you'll leave it in the on position. If you want, to, want them to stay off for someone, put them in the off position. And then you can follow that up. We, we recommend that you always leave it in the sensor position. That's the idea of why we put the sensor in. So when you walk up, they'll come on at night. If you've put a sunset switch, if you've chosen to have a sunset switch installed as well, um, They'll be preset from dusk once the light level lowers to a certain point. The lights will come on and we preset them for four hours. We find that the best compromise with daylight savings and non-daylight savings. So after those four hours, your sensor will activate as normal and trigger, trigger for five minutes and then go off. Okay, we're at the rear, the rear door now and you'll see that in this house they've got the underfloor heating on the back terrace. So that's been explained to by Sam, how he sets them up. Um, and then here we've got the terrace lights. They're controlled by a rotary dimmer. Um, and then we've got a fan. And we've got some rear lights and two, two dead switches here at, the, at present. One being the garden lights and one being the pool lights. So once they're set up onto the side of the house, as, as the front of the house, the garden provision, there's a junction box on the side of the house, and they can work from there in the next stage of the job. And the same with the pool lights. The pool guy will take control from there. If you've gone with an induction cooktop, we've installed the induction cooktop. And um, we, with the induction cooktop, you need to install a, an isolation switch, which is over here in this house. Um, the idea of that is if you've got oil on, a, on the stove and it catches fire, you can turn it off without going close to the fire. Um, that will work now, you hear the, the bit, but often cleaners and children turn the isolation switch off um, and then you go to turn it on, it won't work. So 
Just reset it. Turn it back on and press the on button. Okay, in the scullery, we've installed a sensor in this house and we often install them in uh, garages and walking robes as well, depending on the client and the requirements. Um, so again, that's in the off position. We put it into the sensor position and that will trigger, we set them for about five minutes. If you'd like to change that setting, it's quite easy, easy to do, but they are a, a little bit of adjustment in these um, sensors makes a big result. So you can see that it's firing away the red flashing. You just grab the outside trim and give it a spin and it will come down. Then there's a little time sec little time symbol here and you can adjust that slightly, positive or negative, but just be cautious that any small adjustment can make a big difference in the time in these, in these particular sensors. There's also a daylight sensing when they'll fire on. We like to have them on all the time. So when you walk in, it's, it's always quite dark in these galleries and walk-in robes and garages. Operating your fireplace is always done by just making sure that the isolation switch is turned on. This just this is a requirement um, by law that we have an isolation switch. If something goes wrong or for servicing, it must be um, isolated in close proximity. So just ensure that that's been that's turned on. Sometimes cleaners and children can turn that off. And maybe during the summer months, it's good to leave in the office. Anyway. Okay, so we turn the fireplace on using this remote. The remote has the thermostat inbuilt. So at the moment, you can see that it's 22 degrees. So we can turn the fireplace on using this. At the moment, the fan speed's on high. This is your option button down the bottom here, a little circle at the bottom. So we slide that across and we can slow down the fan speed and press down using the side button. And that's not slowing down because it's starting up still. Um, and you get your light button here and it, there's a decorative light that you can turn the decorative light up or down depending on the aesthetics that you, that you prefer. Then you can press it across again. This is probably the telling one where the little flames are. At the moment, the heat's off, so if you've got people coming over and you want to have a get-together but you don't really want it to be pumping out much heat, you can leave it in the off position. So press it again, get to there. It's in the off position, so if you slide it up, it'll turn on and that will start producing heat for the room. Um, as you, we'll go back to here and turn the fan up a little bit so we get some real warmth coming through. And we can put it all the way up to high to get get it warm and then turn it down as, as we see fit to use. And that's how I would use the remote for the fireplace. Okay, so now we're in, in the linen cupboard and we've installed your patch panel in here. We like to put them in the, patch, in the linen cupboard because we find it's the best place to get cables in later if, if there's something you want to add at a later date. And there's nothing worse than being trapped downstairs where we can't get cables in without causing damage. We, we use a um, Clipsal Cat 6 patch panel, as we find that they're, they're the best, most reliable patch panels on the market, and there's no substitute for quality. In this case, we've wired ports 1 to, 1 to 12 go throughout the house. Um, they're labelled on your, on your house plan, and they're indicated by a little circle, a little blue circle with a number inside it. One, one is, one is being one in the patch panel and corresponding all the way through to number 12. Um, to over here, we've yep. got the, we have the lead-in cable. This is your phone lead-in cable. It comes from the side of the street, side of the house and this is the first point and the best place to test if the phone's active. So from here, we wire the phones in a mode three system and that means that the, the wire comes from here. We know this is active now. We've tested it. We plug plug a patch lead into here, as shown. Now it's going to go into the alarm. So it goes through the alarm. And the beauty of this is, if someone does break into the house, they can't just pull up, take the phone off the hook, and the alarm can't dial out. This way, the phone always get the alarm always gets first first go at the line. So now it goes from here from the lead in through this cable, up into the alarm, and it comes back down out here. So 
we've got phone one and two labeled here. They're both the same line, and we've just, in case you have two phone points, which is pretty rare these days. Um, so now, to, to get the phone line throughout the house, the customers want, want to be going to bed for under bench in this house. So we'll do that by plugging that, another patch lead in to phone one. That's got dial tone running through it right now. We'll plug it into the bed four under bench. And then in the corresponding room, we'll take the plate off, make, make sure that it's labeled number one, and that will be your phone point. And from there on, we'll use a wireless phone system from there. Now we're gonna connect up your modem. The Telstra technician will most likely do this and maybe you can show him this video for his reference. Um, we've got it labelled, it says broadband, in this case it says point of attachment because it's an overhead supply, which is very rare, but it normally gets to the side of the house. So I'll screw this in into here. This is the isolation module. Screw it in. We'll plug the modem in. That will read, that'll start setting itself up. We now, to make the internet go to certain parts of the house, we just plug a cable into the ports corresponding, plug them into the back of the modem or, or to a switch. We do have a switch available here. And this, in this case, we're gonna use a switch, for example. We normally plug a cable from the modem. So the internet's coming out, out of this now, and it goes into the switch. Okay, so now we're going to plug some devices in. In, the, in this house, we're going to plug four devices in. Um, normally, we connect it all up and we're more complex than this, but this is a, a nice, quick example of how, how to operate the switch. So we've got the um, numbers labelled here for the room. They want to have their two TVs on the internet. They want to have the, the media room one. That's going to be plugging into the internet downstairs. We've already done that. So we'll plug that into the switch. So we plug it into there. It clicks in. Same here, you hear it click in. So now the, the media room TV's got some um, TV to stream Netflix and Apple TV through. Um, and now we also wanna plug in the living cabinet, living TV, that's in the living cabinet, number one. So we'll plug that in, click into there. Number nine, click it into number, any number on the router, it doesn't matter. And you know, we also wanna, in this case, we've got two sinuses here. We wanna plug them in and give them the um, Hi-Fi music throughout the home. So we'll plug that in here. That's connected into the internet now. They can stream their music at high speeds. We find that's the best way. Any device that stays still, we like to plug into the, into the router and use the Wi-Fi for portable devices. So now you've got your two Sonos's plugged into the internet and that. Um, if you want to move your phone at any stage, you just leave it from here, like where it's plugged into the phone one, and if you want to move it down to the downstairs TV, you just click the button and pull it out, and you might want to plug it into the living cabinet too. That makes, you move your phone down into the living cabinet, and it's simple as that. A common question we get when there's a storm is, why is half my house working, or a third of my house working, and not the rest of it? Um, the reason is, these three indicators up here on the meter, they're A phase, B phase, and C phase. You've got three phases coming into the house, and quite often what happens in the area, a, tr a tree branch will fall over the wires out the front in, in, in the network, and it will knock out one one of the phases. So two of, your ha two of the phases work in your house, and one's out. It's similar to this. So if I pull this out, you've lost that's one of your phases. There's a fuse here. So you, at the moment, you've only got two phases. So there's a good chance that upstairs lights will be out and some power points and an oven will be out. Um, so that's your first point of call. Other point of call is items with uh, water and motors. If you bring in your old appliances, you're gonna have to fault find throughout and pull every appliance out of the wall, not just turn them off. It means unplug your dishwashers, your free old fridges, and then see if their power will go back on. If there is a phase out in your house, just be sure to not operate the air conditioner as it can it needs the three phases to run in a balanced way. 
So maybe just come around and turn it off so there's no operation caused from other people while the power's out and causing damage to the motor. If your new home electrical requirements exceed the standard switch board, we use a, a subboard. We locate these inside the garage or in, inside the house somewhere. We're agreed on, upon by you. We try to locate them in the garage normally. Um, the benefits of having a subboard are uh, it's much an, it's a, it's a neat way to present, um, easy to fault find. So, as we discussed before, if you lost the, a phase, I think we had um, A phase was out. So, if you, we, we wired in a case that A phase, B phase, C phase. So, at the moment, if, if you did have an out, outage in A phase, you won't have your floor heat, your steamer, and the two power. So, it makes it really easy to um, fault find. Um, it's it's easier for if some power does trip off, which happens, you only get the one circuit that trips off because we can fit each breaker on a separate, each circuit on a separate RCD. So if, if you get a trip a circuit causing a hassle, maybe that, that one, not half the house going off or a third of the house, which can, can be quite hard to tell what it was. Um, so up the top here, we just put the, the main three phase controls, like the, you got your main switch up here, your air conditioning's up here and the floor heat. Then you got A, B, C. It's really easy just to follow. Okay, we're around here at the side of the house now and this is where all the communication conduits come to, from the pole or from the network into here. Um, from here they go to throughout the house, up to the patch panel or to the fox cell box where required. We label each cable with some tape and write the room that they originate from. Um, sometimes you will We'll pre-wire some fox cell points that you won't use. We can just po poke them back into the conduits that are here and just to neaten the whole side of the house up, you won't need them. So the two conduits that we have here, uh, we've got the 32 mil uh, Optus conduit and we've got a 20 mil Telstra conduit, which is a special conduit that Telstra requires us to use. Um, the, the Optus conduit will always go to either a private pole or the council pole. And depending on the circumstances, the 20 mil con conduit will go to either the pit, a Telstra pit, or to a um, private pole, private timber pole, or a council pole. So we'll go out the front and see where they originate. We, we, we put a draw wire here for, for all of them. So the installer just has to tie on, a con tie on the cable to the, con to the draw wire, and you'll just pull through the, the cable on the draw wire. Okay, in this case we're out of the private, this is a Yugo connection, so it's a, a council pole. We've got the 32mm conduit comes to here with the, with the drawstring, so that will, the, the installer will tie the cable onto here and pull it back down the hill and into the house. Um, this is a, the Telstra network here is underground, so the broadband connection's in here, and also the phone, phone network's down here. So. We've joined onto an existing conduit that was already here, and the telco could just pull, put the draw wire through into the pit. We just opened the lid and put it into here. Getting the um, internet and phone can be the worst part of the job, the most frustrating part of the job, dealing with Telstra. So um, we've got a contact that we use to do the installs. Um, if you haven't already contacted him, give him a contact now, and he'll help you with the whole process. Okay, around here at the switchboard, Open the lid up, go from the bottom. You can get um, you can get locks on onto these to lock them. You, it must be an uh, Energy Australia approved lock, and you can get them from Integrity Locksmiths. I think they're North Ride. So if you want to lock your switchboard. Um, so over here we can open the lid, and on the top of the lid we've got the. Um, Diagram of the mains. The main. This is where we are standing at the moment. You are here. The main switchboard, and the, the mains have a diagram showing where they are, where they run throughout the property. So if you're doing works out the front, just be mindful of this. And maybe if you've got contractors working here, just let them know that there's a diagram here to be careful. Okay, we're here, we're here at the rain cycle box, the control box for the, um, your water rainwater tanks. Um, there's not much to them as far as we're concerned. It's pumps controlled from here when you turn the water on the indicator light will come on it'll be green if it's on the tank water and red if you're out of water if you're out of tank water it'll go to red and start running um, so you can keep an eye on that if you 
if you're running low on water. They do, pumps do blow sometimes over time. Pumps are something that can cause uh, RCDs to trip. So if, if you do find that there's tripping it and it's, it is the circuit with the rain cycle on, if there's no light coming on, just unplug it for, um, unplug it and call the number, the 1800 0, 0006 176 and speak to rain cycle. They'll come out and replace the pump and if it's under warranty or or you just pay them for a new replacement. Okay, this is a, a junction box where the garden light provision will come to from the front door. Um, behind here, the three cables are in here sealed off and tested. We know that they work. Um, you can put a transformer remotely here. here. It's a pretty discreet spot around the side of the house. And then they can run 12 volt from out of here to the garden. So just be, be mindful that you can't put conduit here until there's a con uh, any concrete here until we've got a conduit running through here and out to the um, where you want the lights. Okay, we're around up the, up the side of the house now, and this is where we on this house we've located the sunset switch. And we've also got a, a sensor for the side lights. The sunset switch is for the front uh, wall lights and the garden lights, and the sensor is just for the side path. So um, you don't, there's no adjustment in here. We we preset it to four hours. If you would like another time, please let us know beforehand, or we can always come back and change it if you'd like. Um, we can always adjust, you can adjust the sensors through the following. There's a little knuckle here and you loosen it off. Don't try to pull it down without loosening it off. I already pre-loosened it. And you can spin it, spin it around and get it to a position where you can adjust it easily. There's th three adjustments here. One has a little, the sensitivity on the right of it looking at it. We, we always set that pretty high because we want we want the sensor to come on as soon as we can. The middle one's the d daytime, nighttime. We set, we set that around to nearly completely dark. We, want it to come, we don't want it coming on during the middle of the day. And the time, we always set to the first line. The first line's around five minutes long. If you'd like to adjust it longer, you can, you can surely just jump up and um, get a screwdriver and you can, it's very easy to adjust. And we find these to be the, the, the InfraScan sensor to be the best by far. We have very little problems with them. Hi, hi guys, thanks for watching. On behalf of myself and all the team, it's been a real pleasure working with you to build your dream home. I hope that everything makes sense now and you know how to use the products and services we have installed. If you have any more questions or problems, please don't hesitate to give us a call on 9417 0090 or drop us an email at admin at hillselectrical.com.au. We also have a YouTube channel explaining in more details how to program your heated tower rail timers and floor heat controllers. So once again, we thank you and we wish you the best. Enjoy.